So one of the things that the Lord convicted us about when we first came out here was uh, what kind of culture would we create? And we decided that we really wanted to dismantle religion as much as possible <laughs> and, and try to focus as much on relationship with the Father as possible. And, and one of the hardest things about that is that we all have a natural tendency when we're trying to guide people to re rely on our own strengths, right? And if you think about the five-fold ministry, that's in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, right? Everybody know what I'm talking about? We call that the five-fold ministry. Or if Tricia wants to shorten it, she says the five-fold ministry. <laughs> that's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to lay hands on that guy. <laughs> But look, if you're an evangelist and that's your calling, that's the way you're wired. But if you're a pastor, you have just as great a calling on your life, but it's different than an evangelist. And if you're a teacher or an apostle or an intercessor, the prophet, you all have different things that you tilt towards as strengths. Now, we're all called to be all five, but you tend to lean on the thing that you are where your dominant gifts are. And that's a good thing, unless you dishonor people who don't have your gift or you try to get them, you, you want to clone them. Well, there's only a, a letter difference between clone and clown. <laughs> right? Be careful. You don't want to clone people. God has made us all unique. But man, I'll tell you what, it's really hard if you're an evangelist and you want to be out with the lost all the time to sit with a pastor who's spending four hours putting an outline together. Right? Because, wait a minute, we could have won people to the Lord while you're doing that. See? And then the pastor's like, yeah, but when they come, they got to be fed. What good is it if you win them to Christ, but I can't teach them? And each, each gift has its own reason to feel like mine is the best. And we wouldn't want it any other way. Right? I feel like I got the best wife. But there should be somebody here saying, no, I got the best wife. I got the best wife. We should all feel that way. Right? But I'm not trying to make Trisha like somebody else's wife. She's my wife. I got, the, I got the best package for me. Pretty cool, right? That we could all feel that way. And by the way, I'm God's favorite. You can say that too. Say it, John. I'm God's favorite. That's it. And we could all fight over it. What a great thing to fight about. I'm his favorite. See? So here's one of the tricky things. I'd say part, one of the most tricky things about ministry is that whoever walks through that door on any given time should step into a culture, right? Not a church, but a culture, a belief system, a group of people who say, we honor the gift that's in you. Yeah. All right, so we've had a lot of intercessors come over the years because we do focus a lot on prayer. And Trisha's gift is very strong in the prophetic and intercession. And they've been hurt in some of the other places across the body of Christ because intercessors tend to have very strong opinions about things. Right? And they can feel a little threatening to some folks in the ministry. And, and, and by feeling threatened, sometimes harsh things were said to them. Yeah. And, and I don't know that the other people meant to be harsh necessarily, but intercessors tend to also be sensitive. Yeah. That's a gift. Yeah. But if you don't know how to handle that sensitivity, you could easily get hurt. And then the hurt could create scar tissue in your heart. So, well, whether you're an intercessor or not, you should sure be glad we have a bunch of them in this church. <laughs> Those are all the intercessors that yelled, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure glad because they're praying for me. And they're praying for you. And I can't tell you how many people over the years have said to me, I know I've been in other churches, and they say they pray, but your people really pray because they come up to me, and my name was on the prayer chain, and I came to church, and they came up to me and said, how's that thing going that was out on the prayer chain? That changes your faith, doesn't it, to know that it isn't just, oh, I'll pray for you. No, nah, man, it's like really, it's a hardcore thing. So if they haven't felt honored somewhere else, we want them to feel honored here. If somebody's real prophetic and they're talking to somebody with the gift of administration, why are you laughing? Because that's like two opposite ends of the spectrum, right? The, the gift of administration is spreadsheets are us. Project management, timeline. Debbie's getting anointed back there. Hallelujah. <laughs> but the prophetic people are like, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I was praying and I lost track of time. 
<laughs> and like, if you're too heavy duty on the administrative part, you're like, the Bible says, <laughs> oh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We said five o'clock. It's 544, <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> and then there's all this tension. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean you just say it's okay to be late. Right. But you know, like set up a little fishbowl and, and put it like dummy money. <laughs> Every time you're late, you gotta put $2 in the dummy money. Tell them to set their watch a little early. <laughs> there's ways around this. There's loving ways to help people that have a different gift than you instead of constantly feeling like we're adversarial with each other. So I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on that too long, but I just want you to know it's a godly thing. The golden rule is good to love other people the way you'd want to be loved, but the platinum rule is love them they want to be loved if you were them. Boy, it's way harder, man. It's way harder. The only way you could do that is through Holy Spirit, allowing you to get into their skin. What would it be like to be prophetic if I'm administrative? Ho! Oh, that's a stretch, man. And the other way around, right? I, don't, I can't spell spreadsheet. Never mind, spreadsheets are us. That's bondage, spreadsheet. You can see it right on there. It looks like prison bars. God is in the now. <laughs> Hallelujah. I could start a big fight right now. I'm not going <laughs> to. Here's what we decided when we started the church. And really, again, I want to give credit where it's due. My wife, from the beginning, since we were married, she was always trying to help somebody. She was always giving people rides to church. She was always witnessing to people. She was always finding that broken person and saying, you don't have to accept this condition that you're in. God is greater than this condition. And, and we're not going to accept no for an answer. We're going to believe for your healing. And many, many times it was because of a, a, an ungodly belief that this person had been, had, that had been drilled into them. Maybe lies were spoken over them. Curses were spoken over them. And she has this ability to see in the spirit to the root of what the problem is and break that root and see that person get healed. That's a powerful gift, isn't it? But it's not always easy to see the redemptive thing in the person that's hurting. It's kind of hidden down underneath all the packaging that is broken in people's lives. And we're like, well, we can't just honor prophetic people. We also have to honor the, all the gifts. And if we're, we lean heavily in one direction, we've got to center ourselves and say, no, but this is God's child. And we need those administrative people or the bridges would be collapsing. but they're not like me. I'm not going to clown them by trying to clone me in them. They have their own calling on their life. And boy, once you pull that back, now you have to apply that grid to being a parent. And if you're a father and a mother, you can't try to look at your child and say, you're going to do all the things I never got to do. I was going to be a Major League Baseball player, but I hurt my shoulder, but you're going to be a Major League Baseball player. No, don't do that. Don't do that. What is the calling on their life? That's what the Bible says. Train them up in the way they should go, even if they're wired differently than you. And you're like, yeah, but they came out of my loins. How could they be so different? Well, they are. They are. And it's a beautiful thing. They're beautiful in their difference from you. But do you appreciate it? Yes, say yes. yes. By faith, yes. say yes. yes. All right, not so easy. Now, God is asking you as a mother and father. This is the language of a son to a father. That's what God gave us. In the old days, he spoke to us in fragments and pieces. Now, he speaks to us in the language of a son. And we're supposed to speak to him like a father, and he speaks to us like sons and daughters. When I worked at the family business, I was the son of one of the sons. I knew from the genetics in me. I knew from the conversations that went on. I knew from the you know, like verbal lashings that I had when I did something wrong. I was in a different relationship than the employees in the business. They were collecting a paycheck. I was a part of the family. There was a much higher expectation on me. And any, anybody here ever play sports and your father was the coach? 
Yeah, I got one up there. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. <laughs> right? Because if you know the story, even if it didn't happen to you, a lot of times the coach's kids got treated more harshly because the coach was going to prove I'm not going to show favoritism to my child. And that could be a little difficult, right? And that's how it was in the garbage business, too. So I was telling somebody this. I'll just tell you briefly. Uh, my, my, everybody remember my mom? You, the, those of you that knew my mom, she was like Mary Innocent, like no guile, like it says in the Bible, right? No guile. But she was a little gullible, right? She didn't have a lot of street smarts, so she could be taken advantage of if you're not careful. And I spent a lot more time with my mom growing up than my father, who was super street smart, bottom line, black and white guy. So I'm going to get trained on, on, on the garbage business, and it's my cousin who's going to train me. And I'm about 16, and uh, he's 21, five years older than me. And I'm on the college track, and I'm the football player guy. And he, grad he went to 12 different schools in 12 years because he got kicked out of every school that he was in, OK? But smart, hardworking guy. He would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and sleep outside my grandfather's door so that when my grandfather went to go to work at like 4.30, the door would hit my cousin, and he'd go together with my grandfather. They would ride around the town where we were picking up the garbage, and they would pull out any aluminum chairs and stuff that people put on the curb, and then they would take it to the dump and get paid for it. And he would get half of that. So here he is in his 12th school. He's got like $20,000 at the bank because he'd been saving up all this money. See, he's a great businessman. He got an education on the streets. So here's little bubble boy me from the suburbs football player, going to college with my cousin Vinny. Doesn't his name have to be Vinny? <laughs> it has to be. What other name could it be? OK? So like, I'm going, and I'm a football player, so I'm in good shape, and I'm going to work over the summer, and I'm going to throw cans. And you know, I'm not one of those guys saying, well, I should be in the office, because my father's the boss. Like, no, I got it. Like, you got to start on the back of the truck. And it's the summer. It's hot, man. The garbage doesn't smell good any time of year. <laughs> but it smells really bad in the summer. So here's my lesson, first day on the job. I've never done it before. Is being kind of gruff with me, my cousin Vinny. It's like, look, this is hard work. I don't want to know what you think about anything. He says, you see this? This is the can. Got it? <laughs> yep, good, Vin. Got it. That's the can. OK. It's like, OK, see this? This is the back of the truck. Got it? Good. So far, so good. You take this, and you put it in here. That's what he said. What, what did he say next? Got it? Got it? <laughs> like, I'm tracking with you, bro. Got it. That's your training. You're an amoeba. This is what he said to me. By the way, his father doesn't have part ownership in the business. He's my cousin, but it was his mother. They didn't have the same stock price. He didn't care. He'd have thrown me in the back of the truck. He was my cousin, Vinny. And I love him, because it was the best thing that could have happened. He says, what do you mean by amoeba? He says, here's the deal. Amoebas are alive, but they don't know they're alive. <laughs> they're one-celled living organisms. And you don't even know you're alive. You know nothing about this business. So you pick up the can, and you put it in the back of the truck. That's it. That's your job. I don't want your opinion about anything. I don't want to know nothing. Pick up the can and put it in the truck. Go to work. It's great advice. I had a blast. I was in great shape. It got better as time went on. I became a two-celled organism. <laughs> and eventually more.